We'll call the regular governing board meeting of the Lammersville Unified School District Board to order at 7 o'clock p.m. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. At this time, please take a moment to silence or turn off your cell phones. Also, if anyone is here would like to address the board about a specific agenda item and or during public comment, please fill out a blue comment card so that we know to call upon you. Item one, Pledge Allegiance. Trustee Pombo, would you lead us in the pledge? Item two, roll call, please. Lisa Boulay. Here. Colin Clements. Here. Benita Daniel. Absent. Stephanie Olson. Here. David Pombo. Here. Benita J Jatendra. Absent. Thank you. <coughs> Item three, approval and or corrections to the agenda. There are none. Move to approve the agenda. Second. Uh, based on a motion by Trustee Olson and seconded by Trustee Boulay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries, thank you. Item four, commi uh, committee reports. A, district advisory committee, Trustee Pombo? Nothing to report. Um, item B, district English language advisory committee. Um, the DLAC committee was held on Jan January 20th at 6.30 p.m. The meeting was virtual and covered a discussion of the summit of LPAC and a review of the commotion, uh, components of the local accountability plan or LCAP. The next DLAC meeting is scheduled for April 14th at 6.30 p.m. and it is currently planned to be virtual. Item C, Education Committee, Trustee Pombo. Uh, the next Education Committee meeting will be held on February 15th at 6.30 and it is, will be virtual. Thank you. Item D, Facilities Committee, Trustee Olson. The next Facilities Committee meeting will be held tomorrow, February 3rd at 6.30 p.m. here in the District Boardroom. Thank you. Item E, Policy Committee. Um, um, I would remind the board that as given all that's going on, we decided to postpone uh, policy actions unless necessary and we'll reevaluate in March. Item F, Safety Committee, Trustee Pombo. The next Safety Committee meeting will be held on February 16th at 3.30 at the PDC. Thank you and Wellness Committee, sir. The next Wellness Committee meeting will be held on February 23rd at 3.30 and it will be virtual. Thank you. Item five, governing board reports. Trustee Olson. On Saturday, January 22nd, I was uh, honored to participate as a speech and debate judge to um, assist coach uh, Leighton Scott at Mountain House High in, in fulfilling the quota of judges needed. And it was, it was a wonderful day. I judged some Lincoln Douglas rounds and some uh, dramatic interpretation rounds and some original oratory and it, it, um, it was very impressive. Uh, last week I attended the Mountain House High School boys varsity basketball game against Grace Davis. It was a very decisive victory and it was uh, wonderful to see the team having such great success. Uh, last Saturday I was the guest of honor at uh, the Roar Academy's production of Lion King held at the town hall. And it was really impressive to see um, students in Mountain House doing an extracurricular activity that you know we also encourage at the high school with drama. And they, they, they sang well, they acted well, and they were doing it in masks. And so that, that was a wonderful ta time. And, and to conclude my report, I just wanted to say congratulations to HOSA for taking first place in every category at their area leadership conference. I find that very impressive. Um, when I attended their white coat ceremony last uh, winter, they impressed me then, but wow, first place in every category is amazing. And then um, I just wanted to wish all the incoming freshmen for, uh, next year good luck in picking your classes because I know that's what you're, they're doing right now. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Trustee Belay. Um, first, I want to congratulate the fifth grade students at Bethany on their graduation this afternoon from the D.A.R.E. program um, and their pledge to be drug and alcohol free. On January 2nd, um, I joined Trustee Olson in judging the Mountain House High School speech and debate students for their local tournament. Um, and it's been a few months since I've judged, but boy, they have come a long way in um, fine tuning their speeches and their debate arguments. I know they have state qualifiers coming up and I wish them the best of luck. 
On January 26th, I went to the Mountain House High School men's and women's wrestling match. This was the first time I've ever been to a wrestling match, and it was I loved it. It was exciting. I'm impressed with the agility of those kids, their technique and their strategy, and just um, how they just they didn't give up. So, um, and that's the end of my report. Thank you, Trustee Pombo. <clears throat> I would just like to thank all of our students, families, teachers, administrators, and district staff for continuing to power through this this uh, time that we're having with the pandemic and wish everyone the best. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much. I was, um, I was very sorry that I, I couldn't arrange my schedule to be able to judge at the debate tournament. I think this is like the first one that I've, I've missed. Um, but uh, thank you very much for all the support that you guys provide. Um, item six, receiving a public comment. The entire board appreciates hearing from members of the community and public at large. To facilitate this, the board shall give members of the public an opportunity to address the board either before or during the board's consideration of each agenda item, code section 54954.3. At a time so designated on the agenda, members of the public also may bring before the board matters that are not listed on the agenda of a regular meeting. The board may refer such a matter to the superintendent or designee or take it under advisement, but shall not take action at that time. The board may place the matter on the agenda of a subsequent meeting for such discussion or action. Individual speakers shall be allowed three minutes to address the board on each agenda or non-agenda item, and the board shall limit the total time for public input on each item to 20 minutes. While the completion of a blue card is appreciated and helps us ensure that we give everyone a fair opportunity to provide input for their about their chosen topic, the completion of a blue card is not required. Are there any members of the public that would like to speak at this time? Okay, thank you very much. Item eight, consent items for consideration. Governing board meeting minutes for the regular meeting of January 19th, 2022. Contracts under 50,000. Ratification of 21-22 new hires. Ratification of resignations. Approval of early high school graduation or reduction of graduation requirements petitions for four students and ratification of budget revisions for December 2021. Would any board member like to pull a specific consent item out for separate discussion and deliberations or are there any questions or comments on the consent item? Move to approve the consent items as presented. Second. Based on a motion by Trustee Pombo and a second by Trustee Belay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries with four ayes, no nays, and one absent. Uh, Trustee Olson as board clerk, would you do the honors? Yes, um, we would like to welcome the following new hires to the Lamarzula Unified School District family. Daljeet Atwal, food service worker. Itzel Diaz Gomez, custodian, security three and uh, Nasiba Faziar, instructional aide, noon duty supervisor, and I apologize for any mispronunciations, but welcome to the family. Thank you. Thank you. Item A, district administrative reports. Item A, superintendent's report. Dr. Nicholas. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Pablo Ortega to the, uh, the podium. Uh, behind the scenes, he and I, uh, he primarily, but he and I uh, have uh, came up with a brainchild um, inspired by a county board or county superintendent's meeting. Uh, so uh, first of all, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Dr. Ortega. Uh, uh, we have an award-winning uh, early college pathway program. It has uh, over 120 kids, I believe, uh, benefiting from it over a four-year cycle. Um, we've already graduated multiple kids uh, from high school with uh, AA degrees, AS degrees, uh, along with Mr. Faubert, uh, principal of Mountain House High School, Mr. Ortega, uh, his old partner in crime who's now uh, retired, uh, Dr. Jesse Garza Roderick. Um, they have been extraordinary partners for us uh, in this community and for our high school and for our kids. So uh, he's a good man. And uh, so uh, uh, opportunity came up uh, about three or four weeks ago at a county superintendent's meeting where um, uh, five locations for a free COVID PCR testing site 
uh, were distributed throughout San Joaquin County, and one of the sites uh, chose not to participate anymore. Um, so I had contacted Dr. Maggie Park, who is the uh, public health officer for the county. Uh, she called and said uh, they would be more than happy to consider Mountain House as a site. Uh, so we, uh, as a team here in our district, uh, uh, thought about some areas where we thought might be a good place to have a testing site. We, we knew that that might draw a lot of cars. And uh, one of the members of the team uh, suggested the parking lot at Mountain House South Campus of Delta. So we quickly drove out to our good friend Pablo and uh, suggested this as an idea. And uh, Pablo, being a can-do person, uh, said, well, let me check. Let's see what we can do. Uh, a couple of days later, we got approval through the president of Delta College, and we began to put together a logistics team. So Pablo's here tonight to talk a little bit about how the testing uh, process is going to work at Delta logistically for the board. Uh, we are going to send out this. Uh, this is a draft of a, of a flyer, but something very similar to this flyer will go out uh, through all our media sources, uh, school site websites, district websites, Facebook page, such. Uh, just to get it out, uh, and this will help out Dr. Maggie Park's role as public health, uh, Delta and Lammersville uh, working as partners and showing uh, our community that we have a great partnership with Delta and helping out people who want to know if they uh, have a positive test. You want to talk about the program? Thank you, Dr. Nicholas. I, I appreciate that. So first, let me say thank you to you and to Lammersville School District. You guys have always been partners with us, and we appreciate the collaboration over the years and continued collaboration. So just a little bit about the logistics. Um, what we did is we were able to uh, work with uh, the county, Lammersville, and also Fulgent Genetics. And that company has then allowed us to put drive-through COVID testing at the Mountain House campus. It will take place only on Mondays and Fridays. We have a soft launch that's gonna take place um, this Monday coming up, just to make sure everything's good to go. It is by appointment only and there's actually a link, a QR code there that they can use when the flyers are distributed. And the reason we're doing it by appointment only is to control the flow, but the projections are that each of those days, we could, if all appointments are filled, go up to 1,000 people service, which is really good for our communities. So we're really excited about that. Plus, um, at our campus, we work remotely Mondays and Fridays, but we are open to the public from 8 to five on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, which means that both populations won't interact with each other. So that's safe for all of us. And so we're really excited about the partnership. Um, I don't know if there's something else you wanted me to cover, but we're just excited that you folks are collaborating with us through the guidance of uh, Superintendent Nicholas. No, it just basically we wanted, we've been waiting to be able to announce this. This has been moving rapidly. Uh, Officer Bob, uh, the chief of staff of the police department at Delta, his last name is Picardo? Uh, DePiro. DePiro, DePiro. Mm -hmm. He also is uh, making sure that everything's uh, lined up right, following the, the, you know, every T is crossed, or yeah, crossed and I's dotted. So we have a lot of really good people uh, supporting this. Uh, this is really, um, it was an opportunity and, and we kind of just decided, you know what, we can help out the community. Uh, there's really no benefit for, for Delta Mountain House Campus other than they're helping out the community. So I, again, kudos to uh, Delta, uh, uh, the pre uh, acting president and uh, uh, Dr. Ortega for uh, this effort. Acting and president, I'm so sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. The, our acting president is Dr. Lisa Aguilera Lawrenson, and she was really excited that, that Kirk approached us with this opportunity. And in fact, for us, being a very bureaucratic institution, we had to go through an MOU process to get Fulgen to sign and us to sign. Certain stipulations needed to be met and needed to go through legal. And the president uh, was able to fast track it and we were able to get it through in about a week or so. So once we got the go ahead, because uh, she knows you guys' reputation, of course, working with the superintendent before, she, she completely backed it. So we were excited about that. So just a couple of key facts. PCR tests only, appointment only, QR code only. Mm -hmm. um, we have this opportunity because another community chose not to do it and it wasn't ill-timed. Um, it was quickly put together once the opportunity came our way. And so uh, the, uh, we hope that all of Mountain House and the greater community around, uh, if need be, can utilize this resource. Absolutely. Any thank questions you. or comments by the board? I just wanted to say thank you um, for, for all the work that you all did and for the, the approach you took to make sure that it's well-prepared and, and ready to execute 
well, knock on wood, everything goes smoothly. But thank you so much for this um, opportunity for our community. And I, I wanna thank you also and for everybody that had a hand in streamlining this and, and making this happen. Um, I Just to have one question, is there an end date to this or is it, um, are, are we riding this om Omicron bubble and then it's gonna end or is it a, we'll reevaluate in a few weeks? We'll reevaluate, but we're set for June as oh, the okay. end date. Awesome. But everything has to do with the county and how things work out. And of course the rates and so mm -hmm. but as it stands now for us the mou was a six month period that's what we're doing okay thank you so late june thank you thank you i i i did want to say um <laughs> that i have always appreciated the partnership that this district has had with san joaquin delta college i mean from day one it's it's been a match made in heaven mm -hmm. um, and so thank you one more time for partnering with us once again. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Pablo. Thanks so much. Have a good evening, everyone. Okay, uh, President Clements asked me to um, just do a short overview of how public schools are funded. Uh, so I'm gonna give a brief presentation uh, related to the average daily attendance and funding protocols that lead to how public schools get funded uh, for this evening. Okay, so let's talk about some uh, important definitions. So there's enrollment, there's average daily attendance, and there's the local control funding formula. So enrollment, which is, def which is uh, kind of locked into place during the CBEDS period, and the CBEDS is uh, defined as the California Basic Education Data System, uh, which is collected in October, basically says how many kids do you actually have enrolled? That's an important number. It's, a bit, it's, a, it's the gross number. But we don't get paid on the gross, we get paid on the net, and that's average daily attendance. And that's measured by your attendance rate, the percentage of kids that are attending, uh, which is important because that, that reduces the amount of money we would get from the state if we got paid on enrollment. Uh, thirdly is local control funding formula. Uh, I'm gonna talk about this in more detail, but basically uh, the LCFF is, uh, is, is based on the ADA, and then they have two other categories which are based on unduplicated student counts, which I will also give more details to. So our LCFF funds, our general fund, pay for things like payroll, which is 84 cents or so on every dollar, uh, instructional programs, operations, maintenance, facilities, and such. So it's a big important, it's the most important part of our funding. Uh, so enrollment turns into average daily attendance with a very simple formula. You take the total number of your student enrollment, you multiply it by your attendance rate from the previous year, and you get a number. So if we had 7,000 students, even though we have 7,128. But for simple math, 7,000 students times our 96% attendance rate, you get an ADA at 6,720. That means the state funds us on that 6720 number. So the key point here is that um, student attendance is absolutely crucial to the fiscal security of every school district, public school district in the state because uh, without the kids there, we don't get paid. All right, so local control funding formula uh, replaced an old system. Um, it, was, it was enacted in 2013-14. The goal was to simplify how schools got funded and what they were expected to spend funds on. Uh, so it replaced an old system, uh, which was inspired by the 1972-73 the Serrano case, which was a case where Baldwin Park uh, School District and Beverly Hills School District were part of a case where one was highly pover high poverty and the other one was highly affluent and it was determined that there was not an equal allocation of funds based on the affluence seemed to be getting a better deal. So over the period of time between uh, the early 70s and the 2013-14 replacement of LCFF, there was an attempt to equalize low income communities to the high income communities. Um, and over time, it proved not to be worthy. I mean, it was a well-intended effort, but they weren't able to close the gap. So they added to it categorical programs which were targeted, Sacramento-based targeted programs to try to even close that gap. And so at the end of the day, it ended up being a very complicated system. It never closed, totally closed the gap, and categoricals were very complicated and required a lot of work um, and didn't often effectively spend the money. So when Jerry Brown was, pre uh, was governor, he uh, brought in LCFF. So LCFF, for the case of this 
uh, presentation is based on three grants. There's the base grant, which is allocated to all kids and based in ADA. There's a supplemental grant, which is based on low-income students, foster youth, and English learners. So you only get funds for those categories of students because those were the group of students that they felt at the time were the most needy. And concentration grant, which was for highly, highly populated um, groups of uh, districts with groups of kids in those three categories. If you hit 55% or higher, then you got additional funds uh, for 55.1 and up uh, for those three categories. Again, low income, foster youth, and English learners. All right, unduplicated student counts is very simple, but it's very important because your supplemental grant and your concentration grant are based on your unduplicated count. So basically what you do is you take the students who qualify for alternative meals. Um, in the old days, it was called free and reduced lunch, but it's, the, it's kids who cannot afford, uh, based, meet, meet a poverty threshold that they get free lunch and, and breakfast and meals. And it's added to a CalPads. So CalPads is a big giant repository of all bureaucratic uh, required data in the state called the California Longitudinal Pupil Achievement Data System. It's not perfect, but it's big and, and cumbersome. Uh, so the alternative meal applications go into the CalPads, and then the CalPads decides what your funding levels are, and that, that's applied to your, your supplemental grant population and your concentration grant population. In, in Lammersville, we have very low number of low income students and a very low number of English learner students and a very low number of uh, foster youth. And as a result, we get very little supplemental grant and grants money and zero concentration grant money. So here's how it kind of works is ADA using the calculation of enrollment times uh, the percentage of attendance. Uh, it's, it's looked at three times a year, but the key one is P2. So you get your P1 look, and that's kind of your first blush at where you're at with your numbers. P2 comes in uh, in the spring uh, uh, to really solidify those numbers. And uh, out of the P2, you get the best of that year or the previous year, and then that's how your ADA is determined. So if you look at the um, table to the right, so on our base grant um, for this district, it's about $57.8 million dollars of base grant money for the four categories of kindergarten through third, four through six, seven, eight, and nine, 12. And each category gets a different allocation because the needs of little people and big people are different than intermediate and middle school people. So that's how they determined it. Then there was additional funds for class size reduction, additional funds for career technical ed and other things. And so that's your, our, our nut base grant. And so basically all the, uh, the district leadership team and, uh, and our sites are run primarily off of that, that one amount of money. We get additional monies to uh, help the, the needs of our low-income English learners and foster youth with that second supplemental rate. And as you can see, um, zero for concentration grant. So um, our ADA is applied to the LCFF metric, and that's how we get our money. So crucial funding factors. Um, there is a requirement of instructional minutes for all public schools. And the n minutes that I put there are just for, for, the, for the example, but um, we have to hit those numbers or there's a sanction. And um, the way it's done is we take attendance and we have to set up schedules and we're regulated and audited. And uh, the state keeps very close track through the County Office of Education. And one of the key factors for funding or not having sanctions against funding is that we have the appropriate instructional minutes, which means we have to have a certain amount of days for a certain amount of time. So in the end, um, what's really most important about this is that I gave you the structure of how we get funded and some of those the bureaucratic and uh, statutory rules. But at, but at the end of the day, what, what the, uh, I would like the board and the community to understand is we don't have the authority to take unilateral action based on what we want to do based on circumstances on the ground. Sacramento sets the standard. We follow the standard. We are audited and overseen by the County, uh, County uh, Office of Education and the state, and we have to submit reports yearly, and, and, and the board knows we bring them forward for approval. We can't just change to, to, to distance learning. That would be a violation of the Ed Code. We can't change the start or end date of the school year without going through a process and negotiations with our bargaining unit, uh, the teachers, teachers association. Teachers and classified. 
uh, would be the teachers in this case, um, and then, but there would be a professional courtesy expectation with the classified. Uh, we can't change when a, a students attend school. We can't um, change the minimum number of instructional minutes. We can't change the length of the school day or year. We can't change the length of holiday breaks. And we can't extend the school year without going through a process um, and, and without risking violating the ed code, which is where a sanction would come from. And we can't violate the teacher's contract because we can't change working conditions without negotiating them or we'd be, uh, end up in the Public Employee Relations Board, PERB. So it's a very, very complicated thing to have to go through, which is why we prudently follow the rules and we um, do them, follow them to the best of our abilities. So um, I, I have a, a hypothetical uh, uh, unified school district example. So at HUSD, if they were to say, take ten, add 10 days to a holiday break, and their uh, average daily attendance for every day is 2.5 million, then they would put at risk over those two days by extending a holiday break by two weeks, $25 million. Um, that's a significant amount of money. In our case, if we were to arbitrarily or capriciously decide that we're going to extend a holiday break or we're going to change this or change that, and we put at risk daily, um, daily ADA funding from the state by violating the ed code and the rules, in this example, the 10-day extension would cost our district approximately $2.6 million from the general fund. So a massive and significant amount of money. So the conclusion to um, the average daily attendance and how schools get funded and why we follow the rules the way we do is, for us, every dollar counts. Our LCFF base grant is amongst the lowest in the region. So the amount of money we get to our district is low. Um, we don't receive much in supplemental grant and we receive zero in concentration grant. We have to follow the ed code, the state reg regulations, and in, certain, in all circumstances where it applies, the union contracts. And we have to meet a state statutory requirement for instructional minutes. And as a result, we have a lack of flexibility to change the calendar, change the school year in a unilateral way or in a, uh, in a, in a, in a, without having to go through a lot of uh, dangerous steps. And so my final conclusion is any violation of the ed code and state regulation jeopardizes our LUSD funding of which we don't get a lot, so we have to protect it because every dollar counts. Mr. President, that's my presentation. Any questions or comments from the board? Yes, Mr. President. Um, Dr. Nicholas, going back to the LCFF funding formula and base and concentration grants, it it's true that our district gets a little more than half of what some of our neighboring districts get per student because we get very little of the supplemental grant and none of the concentration grant. Is that correct? That is correct. And in fact, the example, um, I had originally had it in here, but I was kind of moving into a tangent. Uh, the best example is with the money that came in from the state and the feds related to COVID relief, um, in comparison to the largest school district in uh, San Joaquin County, which has 40,000 kid uh, urban district, Stockton, uh, these are approximate numbers. We received about $600 per kid, and they received about $6,000 per kid. Ten so times as much. So when you, when you hear that, it's not as extreme with LCFF, but you just have to really look at it. The funding is going for kids who are poor. The funding is going for kids who don't speak English. The funding are going to kids. The additional funding is going for kids who have no home or who have no poor family unit, and that's the intent. So... When we don't have those numbers, we don't get those funds. So we are expected to deliver high quality education to our students and our education community based on the money we get. Just to expound on that a little bit, I've often heard people refer to LUSD as an affluent district and we're affluent, I guess, in some ways, but as far as, as educational funding, we are far from an affluent district. Yes, what I how I would answer that is is the funding we receive from the state does it we are we are not affluent based on that we are given um, an adequate amount of money to run a district. What we try to do is we have no lurching, no jumping around, and when we implement something, we do it to fidelity because we couldn't afford to start too many things 
to jump to the next thing, which a lot of districts do. So we have to have a fiscal discipline and intellectual discipline to run the district. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Just one question about ADA. Um, do the percentage that they calculate, does every absence count against that or, or are there excused absences that don't? Okay, so um, unexcused absences count against, excused absences count for, I got to double check my in my math. Okay, so everybody knows it besides me. Thank you. So I apologize. So a um, yeah. So attendance rate is you have to be at the school and get credit for being at the school. Anything beyond that, you're right. I was going in the wrong direction, and Irene's in charge of that, so um, that's why I looked over there. So. I really want to thank you, Dr. Nicholas, and district staff for your patience. You've, you've presented this a number of times. And this time, I promise, this one in the last board meeting, you, you, we broke it up into two steps. But I will remember those, these meetings and be able to refer the public to those meetings and those date and time stamps so that when there is a discussion about these issues, I can refer them to the facts. So thank you for your patience. Um, I really appreciate your going over it yet again. I mean, because the entire board, we know this, but I needed it to get out there one more time. So thank you. And then just the last thing is I have some good news for the board. And that is um, this evening, uh, we have three members of our district leadership team who are being acknowledged by uh, AXA, which is the Association for California School Administrators. So we will bring them in in person and do it this officially, but since tonight it's being announced, uh, Heather Sherburn has been named Curriculum and Instruction Administrator of the Year. Heather Sharp has been named the Middle Grades Principal of the Year, and Jason Strickland has been named Elementary Co-Administrator of the Year for Region 7 of AXA. So we will preemptively say congratulations to them and celebrate them at another meeting. Nice. And Mr. President, that is my um, report. Thank you very much, Dr. Nicholas. Um, item B, District Maintenance and Operations Report. Good evening, thanks for having me. Um, our staffing challenges have gotten slightly better over the last couple of weeks since last board meeting. We had quite a few people come back, but we still have a, a couple holes to fill in here and there. Um, my office staff and our warehouse staff is out almost every day filling in those holes as much as, as best they can. Um, this afternoon, we had our monthly lead custodian meeting. It was at the PDC. Uh, we did a debrief from our winter break work. Uh, we talked about communication with staff, and we have a leadership skills that we added every meeting. We talk about leadership skills for the league custodians. Um, over the winter break, I attended a webinar. PG&E has a zero out of cost, zero out of pocket cost. They go and upgrade all your LED, your lighting to LED. Um, I attended the webinar yesterday. I met with one of their approved vendors. Um, they're running the numbers for Lammersville. Lammer is the only school that's eligible. This is the only school that has PG&E. Uh, once I get that information, I'll run it by Thor. Uh, if it makes sense, it may be something we might pull the trigger on this spring. Um, the work happens can happen at night, so it wouldn't affect any any uh, student activities during the day. Um, I mentioned a few meetings back about AB 841, the California uh, I want to get it right California School Healthy Air and Plumbing Efficiency Program, the Cal Shape Program. Um, it's a grant program provides schools to go in and do tune ups and make sure their HVAC is working as efficiently as possible. Um, initially, we thought Lammersville would be the only school that would be eligible because, again, with the pg and &E scenario. But after doing some research and talking to people, uh, the rest of the schools in Mountain House are eligible, except for Cordes because it's too new. Um, so we, the grant applications were due on the 31st, which is Monday. So our application is in for Altamont, Bethany, Hanson, Lammersville, the high school, Cuesta, and Wickland. Uh, and the total requested amount was 785000 and some change. So, knock on wood, hopefully we will be eligible and get those funds for the district. Um, last Friday, we had our quarterly meeting with our grounds vendor. Thor and myself held that. 
Um, I still don't have the Keenan report. They were here last month doing the annual chemical inventory. I don't have their final report yet. When I get that, I'll share that with the board. Um, update on solar. Um, at Ultima, they're looking to connect the array to the main electrical panel this week. Um, same thing with Bethany. Um, at Hanson, they're interconnecting the modules together this week. Uh, WIC one, the underground boring scheduled to start on Monday. Um, and at Cuesta, they're, they're doing the steel and the module installation now. And Lamberville is already done. And the high school is already done. So um, upcoming items, I'll be at the facilities committee meeting tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to training the week of the 14th. Uh, it's in uh, Folsom. It's on the Metasys system, which is our building automation system for four or five sites, high school, Hanson, Cordes, Cuesta. Um, we've never been to, no one in this has ever been to the, fa it's like factory training, no one's ever been, and we have a lot of <laughs> HVC issues that need help, so I'm going to go to a week-long training for that. Um, staffing, we only currently have one opening at Bethany. Uh, we have, I checked this afternoon, we have four applicants, so I emailed HR, and we're going to try and interview for that position next week. And that's all I have. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions or comments by the board? Thank you all. Thank you very much, you. Mr. Legrand. Item nine, action items. Item A, consider approval of 2021-2022 inter and intra-district transfer request. Staff report? None. Move to approve 2021-2022 inter and intra-district transfer requests. Second. Based on a motion by Trustee Olson and a second by Trustee Belay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries with four ayes, no nays, and one absent. Item B, consider approval of the 2022-2023 interdistrict transfer request. I'm assuming no staff report. Move to approve the 2022-2023 interdistrict transfer request. Second. Based on a motion by Trustee Pombo and a second by Trustee Boulay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries with four ayes, no nays, and one absent. Item C, consider approval to adjourn from regular session to open public hearing on collective bargaining proposals. Item one, California School Employee Association chapter number 873 CSEA initial proposal to LUSD. And item two, Lammersville Unified School District LUSD initial proposal to California School Employee Association chapter number 873 CSEA. Did I get Is that correct? Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Staff report? Uh, yes. Items C, D, and E are the formal process of the board accepting the Sunshine proposal from CSEA, and which will allow us to formally begin negotiating with our CSEA bargaining unit. Move to adjourn from regular session to open public hearing on collective bargaining proposals. Second. Based on a motion by Trustee Pombo and a second by Trustee Olson, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries with four ayes, no nays, and one absent. We are now in public hearing on the two collective bargaining proposals as discussed. I always feel like there should be Jeopardy songs playing in the background. I was playing in my head. Same here. Okay, item D, consider approval to close public hearing and return to regular session. Move to close the public hearing and return to regular session. Second. Based on a motion by Trustee Olson, a second by Trustee Belay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries with four ayes, no nays, and one absent. Item E, consider approval of sunshining initial collective bargaining proposals for the 2021-2022 school year. One, California School Employee Association, Chapter 873, CSEA, Initial Proposal to US LUSD. Two, Lammersville Unified School District's LUSD, Initial Proposal to CSEA. Move to approve Sunshining Initial Collective Bargaining Proposal for the 2021-2022 school year. Second. Based on a motion by Trustee Pombo and a second by Trustee Boulay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 
The motion carries with four ayes, no nays, and one absent. Item 10, information and discussion items. Subpoint A, annual San Joaquin County School Board's dinner. Staff report? Yes, uh, and uh, what hope is a uh, thing, sign of things to come, um, an in-person uh, traditional event is being held by the San Joaquin County Office of Education, the board's dinner at the Brookside Country Club on Mar Thursday, March 3rd of this year, 2022. Uh, I've been asked to find out uh, w if board members want to attend, and I also have the great pleasure of uh, to letting you know that you can have a choice of chicken marsala with a mashed potatoes and creamy mushroom sauce or basil crusted uh, Alaskan sam sa salmon with fennel scented uh, rice and bruschetta tomato relish and jumbo. This one's cut off, so I'm going to make it up. J jumbo five cheese ravioli and sun dried tomato pesto. So uh, do we have you can I'll also email Noel, but we uh, need to confirm the number and the dinner request. Uh, I would like to go and I will have the salmon. I will also have the salmon. But she's not going. She's <laughs> yes, I am going. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm going and I'll have the chicken, please. I plan to attend and I'll have the steak. <laughs> 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 but I think it'll have to be the chicken. <laughs> okay, I will let um, factors know. Thank you very much, Dr. Nicholas. Um, okay. Oh, point, I, point of order. Will somebody um, get in touch with Vinita? Yes, that okay. will take care of that. Part. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for asking the question. I should have done that. Um, item 11, calendar. Mr. President, um, we have two dates on here that have last year's year, so all the dates are 2022. I apologize. Everything else is correct on those? Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, it would have confused me when I got there. <laughs> Um, uh, sub point A, Thursday, February 3rd, 2022, the facilities committee meeting at 630 will be live here in the district office boardroom. That's tomorrow. Um, Monday, February 14th, 2022, district holiday, President Lincoln's birthday and Valentine's Day. Tuesday, February 15th, 2022, the education committee meeting at 630 p.m. It is a virtual meeting. Wednesday, February 16th, 2022, the Safety Committee meeting at 3.30 p.m. in the Professional Development Center. Wednesday, February 16th, 2022, the next regularly scheduled governing board meeting at 7 p.m. here in the district office boardroom, currently scheduled to be live. Uh, Monday, February 21st, 2022, district holiday, President's Day. Um, Wednesday, February 23rd, 2022, Wellness Committee meeting at 3.30 p.m. will be a virtual meeting. In a few minute, moments, we will adjourn to closed session where we will be discussing public employee dismiss, discipline dismissal release complaint, government code section 54957, conference with labor negotiators, government code section 54957.6, um, conference with real property negotiators, government code section 54956.8, and conference with legal counsel anticipated litigation, government code section 54956.9, I will now entertain a motion. Move, Move to adjourn. Second. Based on a motion by Trustee Pombo and seconded by Trustee Olson, all in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? The motion carries with four ayes, no nays, and one absent. We are now adjourned to closed session. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.